Hey guys, welcome to part 1 of what if Sage Naruto joined Akatsuki, if you enjoy the video then like, share and subscribe and also comment your thoughts as it inspires me to make more such videos and remember to check out my playlist section for other interesting stories. So let's get started. Chapter 1. Prologue. Minato was not having a good day. Sure it started out fine, just like any other. Then Kashina had gone into labor, and October 10th had gone from decent to wonderful. He was a father to a beautiful boy named Naruto. Then some masked man claiming to be Madara Uchiha had not only found out about the Anbu guarded cave where his son was born, but had gotten past the guards, killed Sarutobi's wife, kidnapped his son, taken Kashina when Minato went to save Naruto, released the nine tails in the middle of the village, and just when Minato had him, he escaped anyway. If Minato lived through today, a feat getting less and less likely, he would despise October the 10th. However, Minato had to prioritize. And right now the biggest priority was dealing with the Nine Tails. The beast had so many legends spread about it and its fearsome power, and lived up to every single one. Killing this kind of beast was beyond even the first Hokage, and was definitely beyond his own skills. But while Minato might not have the tailed beast suppressing wood style, he did have something the first didn't. Ceiling. All he had to do was keep the nine tails occupied long enough to finish the job. Minato glanced at the raging tails and gave up any hope of holding the thing down himself. Minato bit his thumb and ran through the hand signs. He jumped above the nine tails and slammed his palm down. And in a puff of smoke the great beast was gone. Not quite gone yet, Minato reminded himself. Using the flying thunder god on two targets of such size was straining even for him. And he still had to get Kashina and, the container for the nine tails. Gamabunta. I need you to hold this thing down while I prepare, the seal. No promises, I might finish him off before you get back. Said the large chief of the toads. As it turned out, the new chief still had some growing to do mentally. In the scarce minute that Minato was gone the Nine Tails had managed to slice his stomach despite the toad playing a careful defense. Any wounds inflicted by the toad's blade seemed to disappear within seconds. Gamabunta stuck to firing off water bullets from a distance after almost having his gut spilled over the forest. Minato returned, now with a small child and his dying wife. Minato summoned a sealing altar on top of Gamabunta's head and put the child down on the platform to begin the sealing. Any other day, Gamabunta would have been angry at being treated like a glorified table, but today he realized it was something he had to overlook. Gamabunta wasn't the only one to notice the presence of a ceiling altar and a jinchuriki to be. The nine tails roared in anger before sprinting at Gamabunta to try and interrupt the ceiling. Minato shouted something as well, and though it was drowned out by the nine tails' fury, Gamabunta could guess what it was he had to do. Just as the nine tails neared him, the toad leapt into the air and stabbed the nine tails reaching paw into the ground with his sword. Minato finished whatever he had been doing on top of the toad's head, and a pressing feeling of death overtook the area. The nine tails roared again, not in rage this time, but something more akin to fear or annoyance. Then the beast shrunk. Gamabunta couldn't find any other way to explain it. The nine tails went from a healthy-looking, if enormous and nine-tailed, fox to a scrawny, laughable facsimile of the terrifying beast it was. But the nine tails was anything but weak, even in its deluded state. Gamabunta's eyes widened as the nine tails lunged forward with its claws, threatening to impale what Gamabunta presumed was the new Jinchuriki on top of his head. Gamabunta tried to dodge the attack, but it had come from such a close range he had no real chance of dodging it completely. Still Gamabunta though he had evaded it as the claw passed over his eye by several feet, not much in relation to the two beasts fighting. As it was, the toad ended up with a wound over his left eye, the nine tails corrosive chakra leaving a massive scar. He had blinked on reflex, the only thing preventing him from losing his eye entirely. The feeling of death came on seemingly twice as strong as before, and the nine tails roared in absolute fury at being entirely sealed into a newborn baby. Gamabunta looked down as he saw Minato Namikaze, the yellow flash, the fourth Hokage of the village hidden in the leaves, fall to the forest floor alongside his wife, Kashina Uzumaki. His summoner dead, Gamabunta returned to Mount Myobokuzen, his last image that of the third Hokage catching their bodies. 
X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X X Gamma Bunta returned to the sound of toads all around in a cacophony of questions. Quiet, yelled Gamma Bunta, one at a time. The crowd parted to allow two toads through, one green and one purple, both only as big as Gamma Bunta's eye. These were Fukusaku and Shima, the elder toad sages of Mount Mayubokuzan. Of course the young hotshot of a chief liked to remind them mostly of the elder part of their title. Little Minato's name is no longer on the wall of summoners. As the last toad summoned, do you know anything we don't? Asked Fukusaku, the little green toad. I, he died defeating the nine tails. I don't know the circumstances around the fight, but if Minato hadn't have sealed the thing when he did, I might not be here said Gamabunta. That's Minato for you. Even when he's facing the nine tails, he still manages to win. He was a good summoner, murmured Shima. By the way boy, I can see the scar on your eye and your gut coming from the nine tails claws, but what on earth caused that thing on your head? Asked Fukusaku. What? exclaimed Gamabunta as he reached up on his head in a panic. His hands settled on a lump in the middle of his head that hadn't been there before. As soon as he covered the bump, it began to cry. Oi, be quiet up there, the toad chief yelled. This of course did nothing but make the lump cry all the louder. Shima jumped up on the chief's head to see what was up on his head, as it was now clearly not a battle wound. Upon reaching the crying mass, she discovered it to be a child, not even a day old yet, with blonde hair and three marks down the sides of his cheeks. Looking at the ceiling altar he was placed upon, Shima shouted down to Gamabunta, it looks like the new Jinchuriki tagged along for the ride back. We can't get him back to the hidden leaf now that Minato's dead. We could send a message to Jiraiya. Then again I don't want to be trusting him with a baby. You two are plenty old enough to have raised a lot of tadpoles in your time. What's one more for a short time? Asked Gamabunta mockingly. That might not be the worst idea you've had boy. I guess we can care for the little tadpole for a while. After all, he looks enough like him to be Minato's son. We could use a new summoner. Then again, we might be too old for the job, why don't you take the crying, pooping, crying, eating, crying little tyke, eh? Said Fukusaku as Shima joined him on the ground, now carrying the baby. Oh no, that's quite, uh, generous, but, you know, I have a young one of my own all the way and, um, you two would be a much better influence on him. I couldn't deprive you of such joy when I already have my own, stammered Gamabunta as he quietly regretted his choice to mock his elder's age. So boy, does the tyke have a name? Asked Shima. I, don't know. A light green toad about the size of a horse with a ridiculous bow and makeup hopped forward and spoke up in an equally ridiculously high voice. I remember Jiraiya Honey mentioning how Minato's son was going to be named after the main character of his first book. So his name is probably Naruto. Could I get a closer look at little Naruto? He is so cute I could simply. Thank you for your help Gamariki, I think we should get Naruto here settled if he's to be staying for any length of time, interrupted Fukusaku. Well you don't have to be so rude about it, replied Gamariki as his voice dropped several octaves. With that the toads all went their separate ways to both mourn Minato's death and rejoice in having found a new prospective summoner so soon. Gamabunta went to lick his wound figuratively by soaking in one of Mount Myobokuzan's oil springs. Fukusaku and Shima carried the now identified Naruto to their house to get a room ready for him, and hopefully stop his incessant crying. Fukusaku hoped that Naruto would be an acceptable replacement for Minato as a summoner. Little did he know that Naruto would smash his expectations into a thousand pieces. Chapter 2. Naruto. Coming. Replied the four-year-old boy. Naruto had deep blue eyes, and shockingly yellow hair. He stood at a little less than four feet, but that was still plenty tall enough to tower over the small green toad that had called him over. Naruto, began Fukusaku, these past years Shima and I have raised you as one f our own tadpoles. Do you know why? Because it's up to me to be the next toad summoner. I know this pa, said Naruto. I I. But do you know what you have to do to become the toad summoner? Countered Fukusaku. Well, I guess I'd summon toads, and maybe be summoned by toads. Ventured Naruto. 
Being the toad summoner does entail both those things, yes. But you'd also need to train in order to utilize your chakra. Now before you ask, said Fukusaku, cutting off Naruto's budding question, chakra is an energy used to do a lot of things, like summon toads. It's produced by you, me, ma, and everything else in the world. Since you hold it in your body, you can only have so much of it at a time, and if you run out, you die. One thing I'll be teaching you is how to use the chakra other things make, so you don't run out as easily. It'll be hard, but if you're not up for it I could always take you to the hidden leaf village. No way pa. If I can be even a bit as cool as old, bunta, I'll work super duper hard. Said Naruto excitedly. All right then. I figured you say that. We'll start with some meditation, said Fukusaku, pulling out a small stick from his cloak. Try not to move. I think I've got it pa, erm, Fukusaku sensei, said Naruto as excitedly as one can while not moving at all. He winced and reached up to rub the back of his head after the stick came down for referring to his sensei as, pa. This training was going to be a pain. I'm impressed. Getting a grasp on sage mode at such a young age is a feat to be sure. Meeting a young, un who can stay still at all is rare enough, but sensing and then absorbing natural chakra is near impossible. You shouldn't have the reserves to do anything of the sort, said Fukusaku, bringing his stick back into his cloak. Well I am quite impressive. The one who does impossible things, I like the sound of that. I dare say I might even be better than you were back in the day. When was that day, a hundred years ago? Said the six-year-old, soaking up the praise like a sponge. To take it back, you aren't quite mature or wise enough to be called a, sage, yet. More like a, junior sage, quipped Fukusaku. Hey, I'm plenty wise enough to be a sage. Besides, I've mastered sage mode, so there's no way I can't be a sage. Said Naruto, confident in his logic. Oh ho ho, mastered, eh? I'd say you have a ways to go before you, mastered, sage mode. What kind of enemy would let his opponent sit there and charge up energy for 10 minutes? As it is now, your sage mode is useless in combat, said Fukusaku. Well what else can I do, huh? You said it yourself, one must be absolutely still when gathering natural chakra, or risk losing control and joining these poor fools who tried and failed said Naruto, gesturing to the surrounding statues of toads in meditative poses, those who had failed their sage mode training and paid the price. Yes, one must be still when gathering natural chakra, but not when using it. And it's child's play for one sage to give natural chakra to another sage. Using a technique I developed for just such a use, the sage art, amphibian technique, Shima and I confuse with you. We gather the natural chakra while you do the fighting in sage mode. Pretty useful, huh? Said Fukusaku, obviously pleased with himself for creating such an amazing technique. Meanwhile Naruto was imagining what a fusion of himself and Fukusaku would look like, his mind conjuring monstrosity after monstrosity for to be horrified by. Seeing the look on his face, Fukusaku quickly explained. It's not an equal fusion. It mostly looks like we're just sitting on your shoulders. Naruto let out the breath he had been holding in relief. Fukusaku quickly jumped on his shoulder and began the technique. It didn't last long as the small toad was violently ejected from his perch. Fukusaku picked himself up and began thinking as to why his wonderful technique had failed so catastrophically. He came up with nothing and decided to try again, brushing off Naruto's concern for his well-being. Upon attempting the amphibian technique again, the jutsu seemed to work as intended for an instant. I refused to share this cage with some pathetic little frog. Out. And the instant was gone, as Fukusaku was launched across the clearing once again. This time however, he had a much clearer idea of what had gone wrong. Pa, are you okay? Asked Naruto in concern. Yes. Yes, I'm fine. Tell me Naruto, what do you know about the Nine Tails? Said Fukusaku, brushing himself off. Isn't that the story you used to tell me when I was a baby about the last toad summoner? Asked Naruto, wondering why Fukusaku was bringing up a fairy tale from before Naruto could remember. I'm afraid it's much more than a fairy tale. Minato died fighting the beast, but you can't kill a tailed beast. 
he was forced to seal it. But that kind of power can't be sealed into just anything. It had to have an active chakra system. And to top it off, he had to seal it into someone whose chakra system hadn't fully developed so that they could assimilate both the nine tails and the seal. He sealed the nine tails into you, said Fukusaku, it's the nine tails that's rejecting the amphibian technique. I'm afraid that you won't be able to use sage mode. I realize this must be a lot to take in, but the toads and I think nothing less of you. This is. Stop. Interrupted Naruto, his hair shadowing his eyes. This fox is nothing. Shouted Naruto, his eyes full of determination. I won't let this stupid fox dictate what I can and can't do. If I can't fuse with you to use sage mode, then I'll just learn to use sage mode while moving. What? That's impossible. Gathering natural chakra, whose entire purpose is to be gathered while still, while moving is impossible. It can't be done, said Fukusaku in disbelief. Before you, sage mode was next to useless. You invented the amphibian technique, I'll invent something to gather natural chakra while moving, said Naruto determinedly. Fukusaku's eyes widened before he smiled a devious smirk. All right. If anyone can do it, it's you. But I don't want you trying this without me nearby to knock the natural chakra out of you. Let's do this. Yelled Naruto. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Tazaguer had contacted him after one of his less appealing missions. He had built up as much of a reputation as someone who doesn't want to be noticed can. He had yet to be listed in any bingo books, but his reputation ensured that he never wanted for Rio. He had yet to encounter another Jinchuriki like himself, but if Fukusaku was telling the truth, hidden villages were rather secretive about their Jinchuriki. Naruto was broken out of his memories by the call of one of the samurai that Tezagare was composed of. Hey, Naruto. Zaji wanted to see you when you get the chance, said one of the approaching rebels. Thanks Ao, I'll go see what he wanted, replied Naruto, looking up from his meal. He stood up and began walking away to find the leader of Tezagare. He turned his head back around to face his meal when he was several feet away. Suddenly his tongue shot out of his mouth like a bullet from a gun, and stuck to the last bit of bacon he had been eating. His tongue then shot back into his mouth just as quickly as it had come out, taking the piece of bacon with it. Petra jumped back in shock as the slimy appendage flashed past her face. Naruto jogged off to find Zaji. He found the commander of Tezagare where one might expect, at the map table in the war tent. Petra said you wanted to see me. Is it a new job? Asked Naruto, cutting straight to the chase. He liked the whole, saving a country, thing, but he was in this for the pay at the end of the day. Yes, one last job. We are this close, Zaji said, holding up two fingers not even an inch apart to signify just how close they were, to ejecting Donzo's accursed root Anbu from the land of woods, thanks in no small part to you. But their last base is heavily defended. Too heavily defended for any of my men, and probably even you. That's why I've hired some outside help for this one. She came highly recommended as a demolitions expert from a good friend. She should be joining us shortly. Naruto spun around as he sensed something strange. Because Naruto was constantly drawing natural chakra from the environment, he could sense perfectly the location of anything he was taking the chakra of within the considerable range sage mode had. The chakra he had sensed now was unlike anything he had ever felt. It was clearly human in nature, but was shaped vaguely like a bird. A very large bird. That said, the chakra was incredibly unstable. Naruto theorized that the new arrival was riding on top of the bird, which was probably a summon, or some similar creature. The unstable chakra could very well be how this demolitions expert, well, demolished. Zaji followed Naruto's gaze to see an empty sky. Several minutes passed before a large hawk appeared and continued to grow as it approached them, startlingly white against the blue sky. As the bird drew closer, Naruto noticed the person riding atop the bird, a girl not much older than himself with hair almost as bright a shade of yellow as his. Her hair went halfway down her back and had one large bang covered the left side of her face. She wore a mesh undershirt and a green battle kimono with white trim. As she drew within earshot the demolitions expert announced her presence. I'm here for the job with the Tezagare, yeah. Are you Zaji? She said. Indeed I am. Are you the Didera that my friend recommended? Responded Zaji. Of course I am, yeah. So you decided to buy some of my art to cause some havoc. Smart move yeah. The newly introduced Didera said. Art. Asked Naruto, deciding to make his presence known. That's what my ninjutsu is, a noble and refined art. Said Didera holding up a small clay spider in her hand, which oddly enough had a mouth embedded in it, teeth, tongue, and all. Look, such refined lines, and a form that pursues two-dimensional deform. This is art. But that's not all there is to my art. My creations flow, yeah. Like this, it's simply molded clay. But my art explodes. And when it explodes it becomes sublime, and for the first time, the essence of my creation appears, yeah. That instant of sublimation is when true art can really exist. True art, is an explosion, yeah. Comma. Wow. Said Naruto, unsure of what to say after Didara's long-winded speech on art, which apparently explodes. Having never really covered art in Fukusaku's lectures, Naruto's first exposure to art were small clay figures that exploded which was not exactly the socially accepted standard of the practice. A much as I love explaining art to the uneducated, we should probably have this schmuck leave so you can tell me what needs artistic renovation, said Didera, gesturing to Naruto as the uneducated in the room. Naruto narrowed his golden eyes in annoyance, but otherwise remained silent, content with letting Zaji explain the situation. Actually, Naruto here will be working with you. 
your job will to be destroying the physical structure of this base, the leader of Tezagare said, pointing to the last root base on the map table. Naruto here will be in charge of the personnel in the base. Can you two handle it? I don't know about this guy, so don't come crying to me if he ends up as an artistic smear on the ground, said Didera offhandedly. Naruto glared over at her. If you can so much as scratch me with your art, I'll give you my entire paycheck for this job. The two blondes slammed their foreheads together, glaring lighting over the short distance. I'll take that as a yes, said Zaji good-naturedly. I'll leave you to it. Remember though, if the job isn't finished, you won't get paid. Yeah yeah, no problem, said Naruto before he hopped into the trees, Didera close behind on a clay bird. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
but the strangest thing about him was his eyes. They were a dull gold, with bar-like pupils and his eyes were surrounded by what appeared to be orange eye shadow. Perhaps some kind of bloodline. Regardless, he would be colored purple by the end of this. That was when his accomplice arrived. Another blonde with equally bright hair, her eyes were blue, or at least the one Torun could see was. The large owl she was on however, was white. What nearly irritated him was the fact that Tezagar had sent two children, no older than 13 to face down experience Root Anbu. Based on the insults flying between the two of them, they weren't even a cohesive team. He took the time given to him by the two allies arguing to send a nonverbal plan to his teammates with the Root Anbu hand sign code. This was exactly why he didn't understand how emotions could ever be an asset on the battlefield. By arguing, they had given their enemies enough time to plot against them. Root Anbu never disobeyed an order, even when it involved attacking an unknown opponent to discern their strength. Which is what one of them did, swinging his tanto at the first blonde's exposed back while another ran at the female. The two of them stopped bickering to throw up their right hands. That's when Torun knew Root would be walking away from this fight in pain, if at all. The Root Anbu behind the female exploded. One of the remaining root members signaled his observations from his better viewpoint. He had seen a small white blur jump from the girl's hand. That had most likely been some sort of explosive that had killed root member number four. In contrast, no one had an explanation for what had killed root member number five. He had been several feet away from the red-clad blonde's fist, but had gone flying back as if Tsunade herself had punched him in the face. Torun decided to take the male blonde, and signaled the other four root Anbu to take out the female. Torun ran at his opponent as the other root members moved at the same time. The white owl that the female was standing on flapped its wings and took to the sky, exiting the base as the root members followed. The first blonde made the mistake of looking at his comrade leaving, taking his eyes off of Torun in the process. The last mistake he'll ever make thought Torun as he went to punch his opponent in across the exposed skin of the face. Instead of the fist making contact, the blonde reached up and caught the punch in a palm that didn't give an inch. What startled Torun was the fact that his opponent hadn't looked in his direction at all. I'm kind of insulted that I was only deemed worthy of one opponent, said the red-clad child, I mean it's not like I haven't what. Torun grinned as he saw that his opponent wasn't wearing gloves. Even among the Abarame, Torun had been unique. He commanded a swarm of microscopic insects that inhabited his body. Through physical contact, he could infect his opponents with these insects, which were poisonous to everyone but himself. The insects would feed off the chakra of their opponents like regular parasitic insects, but the poison killed them far faster than chakra exhaustion. The poison would take longer to spread if it started in the hand, and the limb could be amputated to remove the poison but Torun had more or less one. Still, one didn't become one of Lord Donzo's most trusted by taking risks and assuming things. Torun swept out his tanto for a quick slice to the neck for the kill. His tanto made clean contact, but somehow failed to penetrate the skin. Not only that, the tanto shattered as if it were made of glass. Torun jumped back as his opponent went to punch him in the stomach. Rather than follow through, the blonde was staring at his left hand in what Torun imagined horror would look like as it slowly turned purple. He had won. Then the strangest thing began to happen. The purple skin began to turn stone gray from the original point of contact and quickly spread, overtaking the microscopic insects. The poison had only spread halfway up the forearm before it stopped entirely. The blonde angrily wrung his gray hand with his right hand, breaking a thin layer of actual stone that had formed over his left hand and forearm. Don't you know? Natural chakra is dangerous, said the blonde as he rushed through seals faster than anyone his age had any right to. He raised the final ram sign to his mouth and spewed forth a mass of yellow liquid. Torun jumped over the stream of the most peculiar water style he had ever seen, when he smelled it. This stream wasn't yellow water, but oil. The blonde seemed to know this as well, as he tossed an explosive note into the stream. It was quickly absorbed into the stream, and the moment the child stopped spitting the oil, it exploded. Luckily, Torun had managed to use some ninja wire from his front pouches to get away from the explosion, but the explosion was enormous, and engulfed the room. The inferno caught up to Torun quickly. He fell to the ground wreathed in flames before performing the replacement technique to switch with a log. 
Any normal ninja would try all the harder to overcome this foe, but ninja trained as root Anbu weren't governed by their emotions. Torun knew when to cut his losses and inform Lord Danzo of his discoveries. Torun performed the body flicker technique to put as much distance between himself and the much stronger rogue ninja that had attacked the base and, presumably, killed the other nine root members. He had put enough distance between himself and the base that he felt safe tree jumping instead of using the body flicker. He was glad, the body flicker was known to aggravate injuries received, and he had suffered painful burns across his body. As he jumped from tree to tree, he noticed a large, white spider on one of the tree limbs he jumped past. Almost as if it responded to him noticing it, the spider jumped from its perch and latched onto his face. Right before the spider exploded, Torun heard the last words he would hear. With this, become art. Katsu. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Uruka Yumino was one of the few ninja that was entirely content with where he was in life. He had achieved the rank of Chunin and become a teacher of the next generation of ninja in the Hidden Leaf Village. While he was originally unsure about being entrusted with such an important duty, some support from his best friend Mizuki had reassured him concerning his abilities. After that small hurdle, the two friends were ready to teach to the young genin to be. If only they would stay awake in class. Having had enough, Baruka threw an eraser at one of the repeat offenders. The blue-haired academy student groggily came to his senses as the eraser connected. Sora, perhaps you could tell us what type of jutsu the legendary Sanin all use? Asked Uruka, hoping to teach the kid a lesson about paying attention. How the hell should I know? Argue the teacher. If you're asking a student for help, maybe someone needs to tell the Hokage about the low quality of the teachers here, responded Sora sarcastically. Baruka sighed. Sora was always rude, even to people he liked. Not that he had many that liked him, having the nine tails sealed inside him. While the beast had strangely disappeared after its attack 16 years ago, it had resurfaced inside Sora seven years later. It had taken all 12 of the guardian ninja to defeat the beast. When the dust cleared, only four people were left alive, one of them being a two-year-old Sora. Those in the class didn't know why Sora's right hand was bandaged, but those who were there years ago knew of the beast-like arm. Regardless, Baruka was a teacher first, so Sora would be a student first, not a beast. You would know, because it's what the class has been covering for the last ten minutes. Maybe if you were awake, you would know that. Sakura, what jutsu are all of the Sani known for? Interrupted Mizuki, who had far less sympathy for Sora. That would be the summoning technique. Began the pink-haired girl. Jiraiya summons toads, Orochimaru summons snakes, and Lady Tsunade summons slugs. It's said that. Nerd. Interrupted Sora in a very loud and obnoxious manner. Sora. Detention. Bellowed Uruka, the force from his voice seemingly pushing Sora's hair back like gale force winds. Sora's head was back on the desk snoring away within the hour. Sora had tried to escape out the window immediately after class had been dismissed, but Aruka had noticed and grabbed the wayward student for his punishment. Sora was in the process of carrying logs into the exam room for the replacement technique portion of the exams tomorrow. You know Sora, your grades as they are won't be able to cushion a failing grade on any portion of the exam tomorrow. Even Shikamaru's grades are higher than yours, said Aruka matter-of-factly. So what, you think I can't make the cut, hubbub? Retaliated Sora. What was that, said Aruka menacingly, not taking kindly to a student calling him names. Bud. I said bud. Like pal, friend, amigo, comrade, mate, chum. Exclaimed Sora hurriedly to try and avoid any more punishment. Baruka sighed at his student's attempt to save himself from the self-dug hole. It's not that you can't make the cut. You have the potential to be one of the best ninja of your generation. But you won't be a ninja of your generation at all if you don't try your best tomorrow. It's not a threat, just a warning from teacher to student, explained Aruka. You don't have to pretend to care. I'm used to it, said Sora angrily. I'm not pretending, Sora, began Aruka. I really do. Looks like I'm done with the posts. See ya tomorrow, said Sora as he jumped out of the window to escape the, caring, teacher. Sora knew what happened when he got close to people, they got hurt or hurt him. Sora had decided long ago to go without friends. No matter how lonely he got. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Didn't your teacher recommend studying? I'm not sure sleeping in trees will be on the test tomorrow, said the lightning user. Doesn't matter. Everyone hates me for whatever reason. I doubt they'd let me be a ninja, even if I was the best in the class, said Sora bitterly. I knew your father, began Katane, putting up his hand to stop the question on Sora's tongue. His name was Kazuma, and he was one of my comrades. Wait, does that mean my dad was one of the twelve guardian ninja? exclaimed Sora, stunned by this new information. Why did no one ever tell me? Only Asuma, Chiraku, and I know. Asuma served the feudal lord until recently. He probably forgot you were still around. You can't blame Chiraku either. He lives at the fire temple up in the mountains doing monk stuff. You were too when he died. I thought you were old enough to remember, and for that I apologize. Only recently did I hear that you had no idea, said Katane, his voice drenched in sorrow for leaving a friend's son without the knowledge of his father. Sora was still speechless when Katane spoke up again. Though if I knew Kazuma, he wouldn't want his only son to fail the academy exams. If you manage to pass the test tomorrow, I managed to get an old friend to agree to take you as his student. Did he know my father? Asked Sora, desperate for any more information about the father he never knew. Asuma and Kazuma were as good of friends as they come. I was never too close to Kazuma, shrugged Katane. But Asuma probably knows what his favorite flavor of ramen was. If anyone could tell you more, it would be Asuma. Wow, said Sora, thoroughly awed. I'm definitely gonna pass that test tomorrow, believe it, exclaimed Sora excitedly. Hold up, said Katane, holding up his hands to emphasize his point. Asuma did say you had to pass one test to prove that you're more than just Kazuma's son. Asuma wants to see if you're Kazuma's heir. What does that mean? asked Sora, torn between being furious that there was a catch and confused as to what Katane meant. Like I said earlier, Asuma hasn't heard of you since he's been in the capital this whole time. He trusts me, but he wants to make sure. There's a technique known only by your father and Asuma. He wants to see if you can pull it off. It isn't a complicated technique, but Asuma has the only remaining scroll detailing how to use it. But we both want you to succeed, so I'll tell you where he keeps it. Sora was too ecstatic to have heard about his father and have the hope of more to notice anything suspicious. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
and his brown hair stretched down from the top of his head to the bottom of his chin in large sideburns and a small goatee. All of this was lost on Sora once he saw the waist cloth with the kanji for fur emblazoned on it, identifying the man as one of the twelve guardian ninja. Other than Katane, the only living members were Asuma and Chiriku, and since Chiriku was apparently living in some monastery somewhere, this could only be Asuma. Sora was slightly afraid of being punished by the man he had stolen from, but Asuma seemed more amused than angry. I decided to follow the little squirt who thought he could steal from me, set on stopping a potential spy. But I must say, even if you are Kazuma's kid, learning the flying swallow to this degree in such a short time is impressive. Before Sora could respond, three poles struck the ground in a triangle around him. Lightning sprung from the staffs, forming an electric blue wall around Sora. Asuma, glad you showed up. Now we can finish this, said Katane menacingly as he stepped out from under the trees. Finish what? What are you on about? Asked Asuma, confused as to what his old friend was talking about. We can avenge Kazuma. We can kill the Nine Tails, said Katane, a wild look in his eyes. What are you talking about? Asked Sora, even more confused by these proceedings than Asuma. Where does the Nine Tails come into any of this? Don't tell me you couldn't figure it out. Your right arm, the hate-filled looks, the, mysterious, disappearance of the Nine Tails. No one knows where the Nine Tails went right after the attack all those years ago, but it resurfaced to attack the Twelve Guardian Ninja. Putting two and two together yet, Sora. Said Katane as Sora's eyes widened with the realization of what Katane was implying. Let me spell it out for you. You aren't Kazuma's son Sora, you just took that form after we defeated you. You are the Nine Tails that killed out comrades all those years ago, including Sora's father Kazuma. Nama, Sato, too, and I defeated you using limelight long enough for the third Hokage to seal you back up, but that arm is proof that you'll just break that seal soon enough. I set you on learning the flying swallow to exhaust you so Asuma and I could finish you off once and for all. What? What are you talking about Katane? My dad might not be the seal master the fourth was, but he knows what he's doing. This is Sora, and if you kill him, the nine tails he's been holding back all these years like a hero will be released. I took so much sacrifice to stop the beast before, and you'd see that wasted for some misimed revenge. Asuma spoke in disbelief before drawing two trench knives out of his kanai pouch. I'm sorry Katane, but I won't let the others have died in vain. Very well then, Asuma. If you aren't with me, then you're against me. Sorry, but you'll have to die alongside the nine tails. Shouted Katane as he drew another staff from his back, the tip splitting into three prongs, lightning arching between them. Meanwhile, Sora was shocked by the deluge of information he was receiving. Katane hadn't meant a word he said earlier. Katane hadn't wanted to watch over him, or help him become a ninja. He had just wanted to exhaust Sora for an easy kill, and though Sora was loath to admit it, it had worked. He was dead tired. Asuma's trench knives clashed repeatedly with Katane's staff. Though the wind chakra coating them gave Asuma the technical advantage, Katane's staff kept even the elongated knives at a safe distance. And while the wind chakra running their length dispersed the lightning, some still made it down the knives to give Asuma a small jolt. It was nothing in small doses, but the small shocks started to add up. Just give it up Asuma. Just let me kill the nine tails. There's no need for us to fight, shouted Katane over the crackling of the lightning and the howling winds. Not a chance. Asuma shot back, jumping back to try and tip the scales. Asuma's hands flew through the seals and Katane did likewise. They completed their two different techniques at the same time. Fire style. Ash pile burning. Lightning style. Raging bolt. A large sphere of lightning formed over Katane's head, crackling with power before hurtling down at Asuma. Asuma spit a large black cloud of smoke at Katane, and the smoke also covered his own escape. I always knew you were a coward, but this is a new low for you Asuma. Katane whirled around in the smoke, searching for Asuma. Suddenly, Asuma spoke up, his voice coming from seemingly every direction. Shame you were always too focused on your berserker charges to notice the end of this jutsu. With that said, an audible click was heard as Asuma hit the flint he had embedded in his tooth ever since Chiriku had chipped it. The resulting spark was enough to expose the smoke for what it actually was, highly flammable gunpowder. The resulting explosion destroyed the area, 
and for once Sora was glad for the lightning walls surrounding him. Asuma spoke again as the smoke cleared. Looks like you let your guard down at the end. Asuma walked over to Sora's prison and sliced one of the pillars of the lightning field clean in half, ending the technique. Who let his guard down at the end? Lightning style. Lightning eruption. What? exclaimed Asuma as the ground beneath him lit up in electric yellow. Katane emerged from the remaining smoke, lightly burnt with his staff in shambles, but otherwise unharmed. The electricity from Katane's technique shot up from the ground, electrocuting Asuma and bringing him to his knees. As it was, he had only remained conscious through copious amounts of wind chakra being pumped through his body. Katane laughed at his former comrade's sorry state. As if I didn't know what your techniques do. We were comrades for years. Now move aside so I can end the Nine Tails. No. Kazuma wouldn't want this, Katane. Sora isn't the Nine Tails. I can't profess to know him intimately, but Sora is Sora, no one else. And Sora is our friend's son. I'll die before I let you kill him. Asuma was shouting by the end, and had tightened his grip on his trench knives. Well then I'll just kill you first. Lightning style. Thunder clap. Lightning began to cover Katane's hands as he finished the hand seals for his technique. He rushed forward, bringing his arms back to crush Asuma's head like a grape. Sora's eyes widened as he lunged forward. Katane grinned internally, Sora's desperate slash with his triple-bladed claws would fall a good foot short of Katane. Katane adjusted his attack to hit Sora instead of Asuma. The claws passed by harmlessly, and Katane went in for the kill. Or he would have, if a sharp pain hadn't spread across his chest. That was when Katane noticed the red chakra coating the blades of Sora's claws, extending a good foot and a half past the end of the claws. Looking down, Katane noticed the three parallel slashes across his chest. He had only a second to marvel at the fact that Sora had managed to learn the flying swallow technique in only a few hours before the more experienced user of the flying swallow struck him square in the chest. Flying swallow. Straight line. Shouted Asuma as his fist slid around Katane's chest. Then the ground on the other side of Katane buckled in the shape of a crescent. Katane's body fell to the ground in two pieces, cut perfectly in half by the blade of wind chakra. Sora looked both awed by the destruction caused by the flying swallow and glad that the liar who had manipulated him was dead. Sora was brought out of his revelry by Asuma's voice. Come on, Sora. As much as I'd love to collapse here and rest, we'd best report this to the Hokage. Sora could only swallow and nod as Asuma started to walk away. Asuma looked over his shoulder at the young blue-haired boy. And, good work back there. The flying swallow isn't easy to learn, so, good job. Despite all that he had been through, Sora found a grin creeping up on his face. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
spoke a female voice from the right middle finger. The only time we do not do good jobs is when we do perfect jobs. Collect the information on your targets. We start with the seven tails. Dismissed. With those final words from the leader, the shadowy figures faded into nothingness and the demonic statue slipped into the ground, leaving no evidence that anyone had ever been there. Chapter 4. So let me get this straight. We're going to waltz into the most heavily defended hidden village in the world in full Akatsuki regalia, drop hints about how we're looking for the Nine Tails Jinchuriki, and no one will care. Asked Idara in disbelief after hearing her partner's master plan. People will care, that's the point. Nabbing the Jinchuriki on an irregular mission to God knows where or Lord forbid in the village's suicide. Spoke the young sage. This way, they give him a couple of protectors and ship him off somewhere, hidden, so we don't wreck the village if we tried to get him that way. Which we won't, because as strong as we are, no one can take on an entire hidden village, let alone the hidden leaf. Contrary to his statement, Naruto could think of six people who could probably pull off the feat he claimed to be impossible. Besides, leader gave us permission to put Akatsuki on the map. If some people see us, it's no big deal. Look, my art could probably level a city, but stealth and kidnappings are not my strong suit. Yeah, said Didera, looked to admit that her art had any shortcomings. That's why you're partnered with me. My jutsu are based around small-scale damage with varying levels of lethality. You just make sure the Jinchuriki doesn't start a full transformation. My summons don't like to be called for tailed beast emergencies, said Naruto, both to reassure Didera and fill the time with idle chatter. Speaking of which, I've never actually seen you summon anything before. What even is your summoning contract? Asked Didera, more than willing to oblige Naruto's unspoken request for conversation. The response was cut off by Naruto's abrupt halt. He stuck out his hand to signal a stop. We're here, said Naruto as he began running through several hand seals. Where is, here, exactly? This is just some random clearing. The hidden leaf is just about a mile ahead. Let's just go ahead and get this, brilliant, plan of yours over and done. Said Didera. Despite her frustration, she didn't go past Naruto. She had learned over the years that his sensory abilities were surpassed by none except Zetsu and Pain. When he said to stop, you stopped, even if it was in the middle of the woods for no discernible reason. Naruto finished his seals and put his right hand on Didara's chest, while his left hand took a place on his chest. Just as Didara was about to call him out for feeling her up, a sealing matrix spread out from Naruto's hands, running across her body before fading. Okay, what was that, yeah? Asked Didera, thoroughly confused by her partner's actions. The hidden leaf is surrounded by a sealed dome, which alerts a team of highly trained ninja about anyone unauthorized entering the city. It doesn't pick up low chakra levels, so trade is fairly unrestricted. And all leaf headbands have a small seal inside to allow entrance to the village, so their own ninja can pass inside with no problem, informed Naruto. If there's some all-seeing seal dome around the village, how come I've never heard of it? Asked Didera. Because it's a ninja village. Responded Naruto simply. They keep secrets. Then how did you find out about it, yeah? Asked Didera, now just annoyed at her partner. I sensed it easily enough, it's drawing enough natural chakra to turn my even me into stone. But I still wouldn't have a clue what the heck it was if Itachi hadn't told me beforehand. Responded Naruto, answering every question posed to him with a calm that betrayed his young age. You and that Uchiha, it's weird, yeah. You'd think you were partners with that jerk instead of with me, the way you two get along. Though I must admit, those Sharingan are pretty. Not art level, but they're up there, said Didera as Naruto laughed at his partner's antics. Let's go then. I hear the ramen in the hidden leaf is wonderful, said Naruto, his toad-like eyes glowing with anticipation. Bleg. It's always ramen with you. We're eating some real food this time, yeah. Let's try to find a dango stand, said Didera as the two walked into the village proper, drawing some strange looks from the guards for their strange attire and obscuring hats. That's even less of a meal than ramen is. At least my suggestion isn't desert, deadpanned Naruto. Any better ideas that soggy noodles or delicious sweets? Asked an annoyed Didera. Ramen for lunch then dango for desert. Ventured Naruto tentatively. Deal. The two teenaged members of Akatsuki finished their lunch without event, 
if one ignored the simply insane amounts of ramen Naruto consumed within the time it took Didera to finish a single bowl. Didera decided to throw Naruto under the bus if Kakuzu asked why they had spent more than the allotted amount on this mission. Which of course would happen, since Kakuzu's, allotted amount, practically had them paying him out of pocket, as opposed to them actually getting money out of the tall bounty hunter. Didera looked around and was annoyed to see that her absent-minded following of her partner had led them not to a dango stand, but to the outskirts of the village alongside a small waterway. What's the big idea, yeah? I was looking forward to those sweets, asked Didera, only acting annoyed. She knew that Naruto never did anything without reason, even if it wasn't always a good one. I thought we might want to eat after dealing with the rats that have been following us, hoping we'd drop something, said Naruto with a meaningful glance over his shoulder. Two figures jumped out of the trees and landed several yard away from the Akatsuki partners. One of them was a tall man with beard and a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, while the other was a beautiful woman who was wearing more bandages than actual dress. The first to speak was the man. Who are you? And what business do you have in the leaf? He inquired, hands twitching towards his kanai pouch. We're simply artists and collectors. We were looking for quite the rare piece here in the leaf. Once we heard it might be here, we came as soon as we were able. After all, there are only nine pieces like it in the world, said Naruto smoothly. He was referring to the Jinchuriki, hoping that these Jonin could pick up on the hint. Unfortunately, he appeared to have overestimated them. What if we don't believe you? Asked the female, hands moving into a more practical position for hand seals as her chakra built up. Oh for the love of God, yeah. Let's just get this over with. Shouted Didera as she removed her hat. Naruto sighed as the slashed rock forehead protector gleamed in the light. We're here looking for the nine tails. Hand him over, and we won't level this place. Didera, need I remind you we're here to gather information, not start a war. Let me handle this, chided Naruto as he removed his own hat. He turned his eyes to the side briefly as he sensed a small chakra level retreating. He had almost missed it next to the two Jonin flaring their chakra right next to him, but natural chakra missed nothing. He turned his attention to the two hidden leaf ninja before him. So if you could just tell us where he is, we'll leave with no trouble. Sora isn't in the village at the moment, but you won't be around when he gets back, so don't worry. The man pulled out two small knives as he dashed forward that seemed harmless enough, but Naruto could see the chakra rolling off of them in waves. He blocked the first one with his sage mode enhanced forearm, but the wind chakra still managed to leave a small cut. Naruto didn't dwell on it however, and quickly grabbed the Jonin's other fist, leaving another shallow cut on his palm, to prevent his opponent from forming any seals. Naruto had to appreciate the chakra blades that would have certainly bisected a normal human, and he was grateful for his diamond hard skin. He pulled his opponent and brought his knee into the man's gut, driving the wind from him like a ton of bricks. Naruto stepped behind his foe and raised his hand to deliver the finishing blow when his hand was stopped by the branches of a tree that had grown from the stones behind him. Naruto linked the obvious genjutsu with the flaring chakra from the woman from before. Once he recognized it, Naruto broke the genjutsu without even trying thanks to the natural chakra constantly flooding his chakra system. By simply changing the rate at which he absorbed natural chakra, Naruto could break all but the strongest genjutsu. However, Naruto heeded his own advice to Didera, they did need someone to actually spread the word of their search for the Nine Tails so they could make an attempt when the Hidden Leaf tried to move the Jinchuriki to a safer location. Naruto was so engrossed with his thoughts he almost missed the kanai that the woman drove into his neck. Almost. One didn't have perfect chakra sensing and miss that. The kanai glanced off his sage mode enhanced skin, much to the woman's surprise. Naruto brought his hand down to grip the woman's wrist before flipping her over his shoulder. His left hand went to punch her in midair and send her flying. But before he could make contact, she exploded in a shower of flower petals. The male Jonin used his position on the ground to attempt a leg sweep, but was grimaced in pain when his kick connected with what felt like a brick wall. The Akatsuki member didn't move an inch as the leaf Jonin retreated to regroup. Naruto didn't need to. He had worked with Didera long enough to know how long it took to prepare a piece of art. Didera, now, said Naruto as he turned his back on his opponents to jump onto the white bird that rose from the walkway behind him. 
Didera grinned as she threw her hands out at the two-leaf ninja. Two small white birds with four wings apiece flew swiftly at the duo. Katsu. Kama. Didera was annoyed at the lack of art that accompanied her shout of creation. Instead of an artistic smear on the ground, two hounds made of lightning were chewing on her clay creations like chew toys before they dispersed into the air. The two janin that Naruto had effectively manhandled had been joined by a third that was helping them to their feet. The newcomer had a head of spiky silver hair and wore both a mask and a headband over his left eye, leaving only his right eye exposed. Didera wasn't too mad about the destruction of her art though, she had left a surprise for the man who had managed to draw blood from Naruto, a feat even her art hadn't accomplished. As the duo flew away, a segmented centipede rose from the ground and wrapped itself around the bearded Jonin. The lightning user channeled his element into his right hand and sliced the centipede from top to bottom. And other one of her creations would have been shorted out by the electrical interference, but this art was actually many small pieces that acted independently. The portions that had been cut in half by their weakness didn't detonate, but the lower ones that had yet to be touched exploded with all the glory Didera had come to expect from her art. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Naruto recognized the younger as the Jinchuriki Sasori and Zetsu had found, while the older was Jiraiya of the Sanin, the only other toad summoner. It had been a clever plan, in Naruto's opinion to lure Jiraiya away with a Gamakichi by promising snacks should he distract the Sanin for long enough. It was almost too easy, which is why something had to go wrong. He really couldn't even blame anyone but himself. He had focused a bit too much on making sure that their entrance didn't destroy half the city and so had dismissed the two relatively small chakra signatures that were quickly approaching the target. The three immortals of Akatsuki would never let him live down such a rookie mistake, even if he was still technically a rookie. The approach had gone smoothly enough. They had descended, no one paying them any more attention than they would any other bird. They had entered the hotel through the window of an adjacent room. Naruto entered the hotel proper, while Didera remained at the window to give pursuit should the Jinchuriki attempt to flee out of the window. The two young Akatsuki members had decided to stick it to their superiors by capturing one of their targets first, only several miles from the nearest hidden village to top it all off. Of course, any prolonged conflict would bring both the wrath of the hidden leaf and the scorn of their elders in Akatsuki. Naruto decided to tackle this one himself, since Didera wasn't really a stealth person. Naruto calmly knocked on the door, but inside he was a raging tumult of emotions. If this leaf genin was really the Nine Tails Jinchuriki or a suitable substitute, Naruto was off the hook. All he had to do was not use the Nine Tails Chakra, something he didn't even know how to do, in front of an Akatsuki member, and he was home free. Several seconds after his knock, the door opened, and a blue-haired kid poked his head out, leaf forehead protector on display upon his forehead. To the average passerby, he was a normal kid, if a ninja. But to Naruto, his chakra was a raging sea of raw energy, most of it his own, but trace amounts undeniably demonic in nature. Focusing on the source of the demonic chakra, Naruto found the sea located on the Jinchuriki's stomach contained a chakra exactly like his own. The only difference was the sheer amount, but that would hardly matter. Nine Tails Chakra was Nine Tails Chakra, regardless of the amount. Naruto was safe. Who the hell are you? Naruto had been so focused on the relief he felt at not being hunted down by his own comrades that he almost missed the target's annoyed response to being woken up from a wonderful nap. Naruto went to step forward and sucker punch the target. With Sage Mode, it would be an easy knockout. Only he couldn't move. Shadow possession complete. Naruto's eye widened as he realized what the target had done. The reason his chakra had been so large and easy to read was because he had been flaring it. The massive chakra source in the small room, coupled with Naruto's single-mindedness in his sensing meant that the two smaller sources that had been trying to hide their chakra had been passed over without a second thought. With Naruto now on full alert, the two genin were as easy to spot as his own Akatsuki cloak. Naruto had missed them, and was now paying the price. He couldn't move as the large, now larger, Genin began spinning towards him. Naruto was in trouble. Or he would be, if he weren't a sage, member of Akatsuki, and S-rank ninja. The shadow that was connected to his own was easily destroyed with some sage chakra channeled through it. He brought his hands up to catch the large human boulder that was hurtling towards him. Thanks to his sage mode, it didn't hurt in the slightest, but the sheer velocity and mass of the technique sent him skidding back into the hallway. The spinning finally stopped, but before the large ball could revert back to a more human shape, Naruto brought his right hand back. He used said hand to deliver a powerful strike to the middle of the large mass in front of him. One could see the hit send ripples across the ball before the genin was sent flying down the hall, cracking the wall upon impact. The fat leaf genin's technique ended as he was forcefully sent spiraling into unconsciousness. With one out of the way, Naruto turned his attention to the two genin in the room, who had since moved out into the hallway. The weaker one's shadow shot out once more, but that was easily dealt with via brute force. The Jinchuriki ran at him with a set of claws, obviously assuming that Naruto would be held immobile by the strange shadow technique. Naruto noticed the chakra coming off of the claws, similar to the day's earlier encounter with a set of trench knives. Not wanting to be cut by a set of genin, Naruto spat a glob of toad oil into the Jinchuriki's face. The oil obscured the blur of movement that was Naruto even more as he delivered a vicious chop to the back of the Jinchuriki's neck, sending him to a forced sleep. Naruto continued on to the third genin, the one that had managed to catch him off guard. 
Naruto was a sage. Sages were not caught off guard. It might have been petty, but Naruto was in a hurry, and Akatsuki was supposed to be brutal and unforgiving. The straightforward jab appeared to be a simple attack to dodge, and despite Naruto's speed, the young genin appeared to do just that. Then he went flying down the hall anyway. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Most people didn't leave home after killing hundreds of allies in attempt to murder a country's leader, getting pursued by legions of hunter ninja, and joining a group of legends and monsters. So Kisame was not experiencing a good feeling because he was home. He was experiencing a good feeling because he was home to finish what he started. Sure, he wasn't supposed to kill the fourth Mizukage in battle like he wanted, but watching the life be slowly siphoned out of him over three excruciating days would suffice. Using the blue man's intricate knowledge of the islands that composed the land of water and the secret tunnels that connected them, Kisame and his partner had snuck through the country to the arrive at the village hidden in the mist. The Uchiha wasn't happy about the heavy mist obscuring his precious eyesight, but Kisame was in his element. He had never been as good as Zabuza at silent killing, a fact that irked him each and every day, but the mist was his ally nonetheless. The two S-ranked ninjas maneuvered their way around the village for several days, keeping a low profile as they observed the Mizukage's routine. Of course, the two Akatsuki members left the reconnaissance mostly up to Itachi, since Itachi wasn't a missing ninja from the same village they were hiding in. His Sharingan allowed him to discreetly obtain information from loyal mist ninja via Genjutsu and memorize anything instantaneously. And he wasn't a six-foot-tall blue shark man carrying a massive national treasure on his back secured in some bandages. That might have also had something to do with it. Over a week or two, the dangerous duo had discovered that among the Mizukage's routine, the young ruler trained on a private island not even his Anbu were allowed on. Not only would the Mizukage be alone, but any massive combat commotion that would no doubt ensue when three ninja of their caliber clashed would be written off as the Mizukage training. The two snuck onto the island as the Mizukage left from his training session and prepared for his arrival the next day. Upon arriving at his island retreat the next day, Yugura entered a forest that he hadn't destroyed yet during his training. He walked into the foliage for several minutes before he stopped and spoke aloud. I'm fully aware why Kisame would be after me, but I find it difficult to imagine what I did that deserves the wrath of an Uchiha as well. Kisame is aware of this, but I'll warn as Uchiha as well. If you fight me with Kisame, it will be the last fight of your life. The two Akatsuki members emerged from the trees into the clearing where Yugura stood. Itachi was the one to respond in his monotone drawl. We could care less about you. We're after the tailed beast, you are a minor inconvenience. Yugura laughed aloud at that. You really think you can take me? Asked Kisame. He tried once before, and it took all his skills to escape with his life. And I haven't been resting on my laurels either. So come at me, and see if you can make me draw even a drop of the Three Tails Chakra. Said Yagura as he took the hooked staff from its place on his back. Yagura held out his other hand in a half ram seal as he held out his staff. A small circle of water formed at the tip, and launched a barrage of needles at the Akatsuki members. Upon closer inspection, one would see that these needles were not made of water as one might expect, but of coral. The Mizukage's coral was unique even by ninja standards, as it drained chakra from whatever it latched onto to grow even larger, eventually encasing its target. Kisame stabbed his blade into the ground and balanced on top of it to get above the coral's reach, but Itachi allowed himself to be struck, only to dissolve into a flock of crows. Kisame meanwhile was busy forming hand seals while balancing on the hilt of Samahata. Upon finishing the seals, the water specialist of Akatsuki reared back his head before puking out hundreds of gallons of water, forming a small tidal wave. As the water rose into the air, Yugura simply twirled his staff around in a circle, the motion forming a larger mirror of water. Upon completing the circle, Yugura hooked the top of his mirror with his staff and drug it to the ground in a single movement. When the mirror struck the ground, water exploded upwards, far more than the mirror had been composed of. Soon Yagura stood atop his own tidal wave, equal in size and shape to Kisami's own. The two exploding water shockwaves collided and cancelled each other out, and Samahata collided with Yagura's staff in a mighty clash of steel and scales. The excess water from the attacks flooded the forest under several dozen feet of water. The two mist ninja landed apart from each other, standing on the water as Itachi reformed out of crows next to Kisame. The blue shark man was frustrated that his attack had been so easily beaten, but Yagura leaned on his staff wearing a smirk. Kisame ran at the Mizukage, who brought up his staff in a defensive stance. Itachi ran after Kisame to assist, but the Mizukage was doing nothing but defending almost contemptuously, wielding his staff effortlessly with one hand. 
Yagura brought the hook of his weapon down to catch the hilt of Samahata, ripping it from Kisami's grasp. Coral palm, shouted Yagura as he struck forward with his free hand at Kisami's exposed chest. Before he could make contact however, Itachi struck with his own jutsu. Yagura and Kisame jumped apart as the flaming dragon screamed past them, the water beneath it turning into steam. Yagura's hand caught the edge of the flames despite his hasty retreat, leaving him with a bad burn across his left hand, but nothing an experienced ninja like Yagura couldn't ignore. Kisame landed, and Samahata shot through the water towards him, eager to be reunited with its master. Itachi and Kisame glanced at each other, then nodded in unison. The two moved in perfect harmony, created from years of working together. Itachi dissolved once more into a flock of crows, as Kisame sprinted around Yagura. The crows flocked around Yagura to obscure his vision, but Yagura was able to bat away those that came too close with ease, and sensing Kisami's monstrous chakra was so simple an academy student could do it. Time seemed to slow however, as one of the crows flew directly past his face, its Sharingan eye staring back intently. The world dissolved to black and white, and the clouds moved backwards in the sky. The crows flying about morphed into shuriken that flew towards the fourth mazukage at amazing speeds, digging into his flesh and restricting his movement. The mazukage was no stranger to genjutsu, and recognized this one almost immediately, but somehow, the genjutsu was resisting his attempts to disrupt it. However, through sheer force of will, the mazukage endured. He convinced himself that the pain was not real, even though every fiber of his body was shouting the exact opposite. He convinced himself the pain was fake, until a large object hit him square in the back. He could feel the chakra being drained, no, even as Samahata was dragged along his back. The most powerful of the seven swords shaved off a fair bit of flesh as well. Yagura could only compare the sensation to having a stick covered in razor blades run across his back, only several hundred times worse. Looking up to the black sky, Yagura saw that not even that pain had been able to break him out of the genjutsu. As he gazed upon the Sharingan moon, he realized it was getting closer. He tried to move, but the pain, both real and genjutsu induced, made sure he could only look on in terror as the orb descended and crushed him. In the distance, he heard Itachi's monotonous voice echo, 71 hours 59 minutes and 59 seconds remaining. Itachi held his hand up to cover his bleeding left eye as Yagura collapsed on the ground. Kisame turned his eyes to his partner, worried that whatever technique Itachi used had some detrimental side effect. Their attention quickly turned to the Mizukage, who despite the powerful genjutsu and extreme pain was standing back up, this time coated in a cloak of solid red chakra. Three tails swished behind him as he moved his hands together into a series of hand seals. Kisame brought up Samahata, to deflect whatever came at them and Itachi's Sharingan blazed back to life, showing him every move in slow motion before it was made. But neither of them was prepared for what came next. The Mizukage slammed his hands together and released a massive blast of demonic chakra. The deep water that Kisame had placed to assist his techniques was pushed back in a large tidal wave that the Akatsuki partners jumped away from. When the water settled, the Mizukage was gone, leaving the two missing ninja alone on a placid lake. It seemed as though he had made his escape, but Samahata and Itachi's Sharingan picked up the buildup of chakra below in time for them to start running away. The lake beneath their previous location suddenly erupted in a spray of water and deadly black chakra. As the blast dissipated, a large three-tailed turtle emerged from the depths of the water. One eye closed, the spiky beast spat out a massive ball of water that quickly approached the two Akatsuki members. Kisame brought Samahata up to block the attack, and the shark sword ate the chakra in the water bullet. Kisame was taken aback when the enormous amount of chakra caused Samahata grow exponentially, its sudden increase in mass almost causing Kisame to drop his sword. The most powerful of the seven swordsmen had been sure that Samahata could take more than one water bullet, but he didn't know that it wasn't a water bullet. In actuality, it had been a ball of pure water chakra, dense enough to have the appearance of real water. Kisame steadied his now even more massive sword as the half-submerged three tails quickly swam towards them. Kisame quickly ran through the hand signs of the one jutsu he knew that might be able to defeat the beast as the hilt of his sword snaked its way up his sleeve. The transformed Yagura was met with a large ball of water in front of him, but confident in the swimming abilities of his transformed state, swam right on in. 
He could immediately feel his chakra being drained, but against the raw power of a tailed beast, the amount being taken was a pittance. The Mazukaj saw a small creature darting around his head, and felt it striking at his hard shell, drawing a little chakra each time. As it darted before him once more, he noticed the figure was actually Kisame, who had somehow developed a method of fusing with his sword to become even more shark-like. The monster that Kisame had become was puny compared to the monster Yagura had become, but he was fast monster underwater. Kisame ran through some quick hand seals and summoned a multitude of sharks made of the surrounding water to hide himself in his heave, and his sharks, began eating away at the three tails chakra reserves. The beast bellowed and swung its tails, destroying many sharks, but the predators seemed to be numberless, splitting into more when they ate enough chakra. The three tails roared, the sound containing a huge amount of chakra itself. Enough chakra, in fact, to disrupt Kisami's feeding frenzy technique, as the sharks dispersed into the surrounding waters. The demonic turtle had definitely lost mass, and Kisame was glad to know his jutsu had done something, even if he had been stealing chakra, not flesh. Then Kisame noticed that the beast was actually regaining its previous size before his eyes. The half-shark looked closer and saw that the edges of the beast were made of the same red chakra he had seen the mazukage covered in after Itachi's genjutsu. Kisame grinned as he realized the implications of fighting an opponent whose entire body was composed of chakra. The water expert of Akatsuki dispersed his water prison shark dance technique, the water running off into the ocean. His sword emerged from his arm as his appearance become more normal. The three tails didn't expect the sudden change of battlefield, and so fell to the ground from the now air-inhabited sky. Kisame looked up and began flying through the seals needed for his trump card before the giant turtle crushed him. He finished, and thrust his hand skyward. Super water shark bomb, shouted Kisame as the water beneath him churned upward, forming a massive shark that charged the falling three tails. The shark engulfed its target, then clamped its mouth shut, mimicking a movement made by Kisami's hands. The three tails began to rapidly shrink and the shark bomb rocketed up into the sky as it grew to epic proportions, dwarfing the sun in the sky. The now chakra-less Yagura was launched along in the torrent of water. The technique lived up to its name as it exploded high in the sky. Kisame panted with his arms raised to the sky as he looked over at his partner who was looking as odd as his Uchiha pride would let him. The Uchiha had made himself scarce when Kisame had flooded the battlefield, and Kisame was glad for it. They both knew that the fire user would only be a hindrance in the water prison shark dance. The debris from Kisame's shark bomb fell from the sky like rain, but one chunk was larger than the rest. Kisame and Itachi looked at the very wet, very dead body of the fourth Mizukage before turning their gaze to each other. The final attack had been too powerful, fueled by the full power of a tailed beast, and had killed Yagura. The two were not excited to think of Pain's reaction to their failed mission. On the upside, no one will know it was Akatsuki if we get out of here fast enough. Suggested Kisame. Itachi simply nodded, and the two quickly disappeared. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Most took the being hit by nothing after dodging story is the word of a concussed genin who had been in a genjutsu coma for two weeks. But Jiraiya knew such technique was possible. And he knew of only two people besides himself who could do it. Ah, Jiraiya my boy. How nice of you to visit. What brings you out to our humble mountain? Asked Fukusaku as Jiraiya approached the dwelling of the two elderly toads. Ma's a little mad ya don't come by more often, so you might want to compliment her cooking first if ya want her to talk to you, whispered Fukusaku to the old toad summoner. Actually pa, I'm here to see if you know anything about a group called Akatsuki, said Jiraiya, cutting right to the chase. I fought one of their members, and I he did things only a toad summoner could do. I was wondering when you two would meet, said Shima as she emerged from the hut carrying a platter of various bugs and insects. Naruto has been a toad summoner in the world for several years now. What? What happened to me picking my own apprentice and successor? And besides, he's allied with the enemy. Exclaimed Jiraiya. Akatsuki isn't just a group of missing ninja, they directly attack the hidden leaf. You had your shot to pick a successor, but Minato died. And as tragic as that was, there wasn't another successor coming from you, so we picked him to be our summoner, said Fukusaku calmly. And before you get your mouth all puffed up, the toads serve their summoner. We've been allied with others before the hidden leaf and we'll be allied with others after the hidden leaf. As long as we have a summoner roaming the world, the toads are content. So, what? I'm not a toad summoner anymore. Asked Jiraiya in disbelief. No no no. The toads will still heed your calls and follow your instructions, but we'll also do the same for anyone else who holds our summoning contract. Now calm down before you start crying and have some lunch, said Shima reassuringly as she held up the platter of food for Jiraiya to sample. No, thanks. I uh, just ate before I came up here, panicked the Sanin before becoming serious once more. I understand your reasons, but I still don't like this. Having a toad summoner playing for the other team is something I can't support, and I can't believe you do. Jiraiya, we're older than you by a long shot. This isn't our first picnic, and the transition between summoner loyalties is always conflicting. This method has worked for the toads in the past and it will work again. Maybe not for you, but consider it a trial by fire. If you can beat Naruto, you can pick another summoner to succeed you as the strongest toad summoner, said Fukusaku solemnly, showing every one of his hundreds of years through his words. All right. I'm not one to argue with tried and true methods like that, but I will be beating this upstart brat and defending my summoning contract, said Jiraiya, acknowledging his resignation to the way things had to be. So his name is Naruto, huh? Seems familiar. He was named after your first book, you fool, said Fukusaku, almost proudly. Huh? grunted Jiraiya. I guess he sort of is my legacy, but if so, he's a legacy I have to erase. Akatsuki isn't some after-school club. They're my enemies, and anyone affiliated with them has to go down. Fukusaku and Shima could only worry about for the lives of their students as Jiraiya walked away from the two elder sages. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
he had dared defy a god, and paid the price. Payne did have to admit though, the fool had earned his place as an S-ranked ninja. It was a confidence booster as well. If Payne could defeat the great Madara Uchiha, he could defeat anyone. But for the most part, Akatsuki helped them get what they wanted, and that was how the missing ninja world worked. You did what suited you with who suited you and dumped them the moment something else suited you more. The process usually involved one of the parties dead on the ground, but not only the best survived. And Akatsuki were the best. Yet the best had messed up twice, once to expose them and their short-term goals to the hidden leaf, and once to delay their plan a full three years. There was a meeting of Akatsuki about to start, and Payne would let the four failures know the depths of his displeasure. Chapter 6 Naruto hadn't been happy to receive Payne's anger, even though it was more like being informed of his failure. He was just reminded that he had failed in front of nine of the most powerful people in the world, all of whom had been doing this for much longer than he had, Didera excluded. Akatsuki's youngest had blown their mission, and exposed Akatsuki as a criminal group hunting Jinchuriki in the process. Naruto had been relieved that Kisame and Itachi had apparently also screwed up big time, managing to kill one of the nine people in the world that Akatsuki was supposed to take alive. The whole debacle would push Akatsuki's plans back a full three years, during which they would lay low and hope that Akatsuki would be forgotten. In the meantime, Akatsuki still had to take jobs, both to keep a steady income and to keep in view of the other nations that employed the group. Dropping off the face of the map would raise more questions than they would like. Months had passed, but the two teams responsible were still paying for their failure. To pay for their failure, the two blondes had been given second to last pick of the missions. Kakuzu had jumped on the bounty hunting request before his partner could blink, or swear, and Sasori decided to take an assassination job that would hopefully net him a strong puppet. As leader of Akatsuki, Payne could not be bothered with missions, so Didera had decided to take the more interesting of the two remaining jobs. At the end of the day, conquering a small nation sounded much more fun than stealing a piece of art. Plus Didera would likely disagree with the so-called art, and turn it into true art, voiding the contract to recover the masterpiece intact. So the two youngest members of Akatsuki left to blow up a nation, leaving their two elders to sneak into a museum. The land of honey wouldn't know what hit it. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
not that you losers would be trusted with a mission even that important. Shot back the Uchiha. Yeah, Sasuke is the best around. It's amazing he isn't being given an even more important mission, like an A rank. Shrieked the pink-haired member of the team. Whatever. Retorted Sora. Our mission was a special request from the feudal lord himself. Beat that you jerks. Actually, I think you'll find none of you will win this little argument. Interrupted the Hokage, reminding everyone of the present company. The two teams stood in a single line like the soldiers they were, and not the children they had been behaving like. Since, you'll all be going on the same B-rank mission, no one can claim to be better than the others. Of course, as the only Chunin here, Shikamaru will be leading this mission. The Hokage took a second to chuckle to himself at the incredulous expressions on the Genin's faces. The single Chunin in the room looked like he might be sick. Now would you like me to explain what this mission is? Of course. Our apologies Lord Hokage. Answered Shikamaru promptly. Please continue. Put bluntly, this mission will be a kidnapping. A young lord is being held in the capital of the land of honey. The mission will be to recover him from the land of honey, and bring him back to the land of fire. Due to political reasons that I won't bore you with, anonymity is required. You must not be discovered. The details are in the mission scroll I gave you, said the Hokage, all business from this point out. The assembled teenagers gulped as they witnessed the change from kind grandfather to ruthless dictator in under a second. Do you understand? Of course Lord Hokage, said Shikamaru. He turned to address the other five members of his team. Let's go. The six classmates all exited the room and quickly left the building for their destination. The Hokage watched them leaving through the large window of his office. Without turning around, he addressed the brown-haired Anbu member behind him. This mission is meant as a test for Shikamaru, to see if he can handle himself in the field, but this mission could quickly spiral into an A or even S rank. I'll trust your judgment on how far they can handle themselves. Just try to keep them safe discreetly. Of course sir, said the Anbu as he faded into the wooden floorboards of the office floor. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
we might as well just head back now and say the mission was a failure. Hold on. I never said it was a complicated role, just a key one, said Shikamaru. The goal is to use an annual eating competition as a distraction while we remove the young lord. An eating competition will be much more interesting to watch with these two participating, don't you think? I'll go along with this plan. You know what you're doing, spoke up Sasuke, and his two female teammates were quick to agree, then disagree about who was the first to agree. We know you're a genius, so just point us in the right direction, said Sora, pointing over his shoulder to Choji, who nodded in agreement. Good. I'll explain each of your roles in greater detail when we get to that point. Right now, Choji and Sora have to register for the competition. I'd hurry, since registration closes in an hour, said Shikamaru, catching the look on his teammates' face when they heard about being only an hour away from losing as much food as they could eat. As an Akamichi, Choji converted his calories and stored fat directly into chakra for his techniques. This had turned into a love of eating, as using even a single technique left the rotund genin feeling incredibly hungry. Sora on the other hand had no such excuse, he just ate massive quantities of any food he found delicious. His claim that everyone else was just bad at eating didn't convince anyone, but it appeared that the two's love of food would come in handy on this mission. Just know that for the plan to work, one of you has to come in second place. Any plan that involves food is fine by me. Let's go Sora, shouted Choji. The two shouted a loud huzzah in unison before running into the city proper. Shikamaru sighed at his team, before he turned to the other three genin he had been placed in charge of. Team 7 looked at him skeptically, but held back any chatter. All right, Ino you're with me. Sasuke and Sakura, you find a hotel for us to stay at. The competition lasts for two days, and we may need to take a third to get everyone back together. Make it out of the way enough to hide a body, but close enough to the courtyard that we won't have far to go. Got it. HMPH. As if I would screw up something as simple as that. Should we meet you after the room is booked? Inquired Sasuke. No. I'll need your Sharingan for the plan tomorrow, but take it easy today and lay low. Answered Shikamaru. Understood. Said the members of Team 7. The rookies scattered to enact Shikamaru's plan. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Glad I could help, mumbled the blonde artist, rolling an eye for emphasis even though Naruto couldn't see it. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
we just walk up and give the nine tails some steak or eat some calamari right in front of the eight tails. We could stand on their heads and pretend to be controlling them, said Didera, imaging riding on the head of the nine tails like the legendary Madara Uchiha. I wonder if their fur is soft, yeah. Who knows? We'll find out when we start sealing them, shrugged Naruto, before sitting upright and turned to face his partner, a wide smile on his face. Let's agree to find out as soon as we can. We can't hunt Jinchuriki for three more years thanks to Kisame killing his target, but as soon as those three years are up, we take out your target as fast as we can. Deal. Sound like a plan, yeah. Deal. Agreed Didera. Her target, the one tail, would be the first down. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Taitwaki escorted Chio and her father to their rooms, after clearing the insides of any intruders, and left to check up on Shu, he could only hope that Shu was still in there. While his mind continued to affirm the truth of the matter, he could not help but doubt himself. His fears were well founded. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Their blonde hair, one done up in a ponytail and the other in loosely kept spikes, further identified them as the members of Akatsuki that had defeated not only Team 10, but Asuma and Kurenai as well, apparently without breaking a sweat. Looking past them, as if he could, Sasuke was ecstatic to see Sora alive and well, standing alongside the samurai he had fooled earlier in the day with his Sharingan's Genjutsu. The two stood side by side, almost obscuring the small girl behind them, fearfully clutching a Naginata. The two Akatsuki members hadn't appeared to have noticed him yet, so he ran forward, the boards cracking underfoot as he ran through hand seals. Feet away, his hand was engulfed in blue lightning and the air was filled with the screeching of a thousand birds. As he ran, his left hand intent on impaling the heart of the longer-haired blonde, he shouted the name of his jutsu, the A-rank assassination jutsu passed down by Kakashi of the Sharingan, one of three people on the face of the planet left with the legendary bloodline. Chidori. His Sharingan proved a curse then, as he could see every second in slow motion and had it engraved into his memory forever. His hand was stopped short of the Akatsuki members back by the right hand of the other one. The man's grip was crushing, and thought he sheer proximity to the Chidori caused minor burns on his skin, those healed before Sasuke's very eyes as they appeared. Sasuke knew he was completely outclassed when the blonde who couldn't possibly be more than five years his senior spoke for the first time. Impudent fool. The insult was accompanied by a large force that pulled him off his feet and slammed him into the ground in front of the two dangerous ninja. Sasuke. Sasuke was vaguely aware of Sora voicing his concern, but his spinning head had only heard the word spoken by the Akatsuki member that was looking down at him. I guess the Sharingan doesn't make a ninja great. It must only be Itachi's innate skill that makes him so powerful. If I were him, I'd be ashamed to call you my brother. The mere mention of Itachi would have normally sent Sasuke flying into a murderous rage at the person who would dare compare him to his treacherous brother. But this man had just sent Sasuke sprawling, and he could barely move, let alone fight. Still, he wishes to kill you himself, so I'll let you live to fight another day. But don't show up with these paltry skills, or he won't even have to open his eyes. The Akatsuki member's foot came down at Sasuke's stunned face, and he fell into unconsciousness. Naruto turned to the Jinchuriki and the samurai that were guarding the last member of the royal family. We aren't able to capture you at the moment Nine Tails, so step aside and we'll let you take you Uchiha friend and leave. And let you murder this girl, no way. Shouted Sora at the two Akatsuki members that were assigned to capture him. I'll die before I let you kill a defenseless little girl. Ha. Huh. How many do you think my art got, yeah? Asked Didera, doubled over with fake laughter as she faced her partner. She straightened up and turned back to Sora. We're S-rank missing ninja who get employed for war. If you want us to stop killing, you'll have to kill us, and that's not happening. Sora's clever and stubborn retort was cut off by Naruto's controlled, combat, voice. Let's go Didera. What? There's only two left, and we can capture your target while we're at it. Why would we want to leave? Exclaimed Didera, incredulous that he would give up so easily. We aren't allowed to capture him at this point, unless you'd rather go against leader. And if we fight, he'll fight to the death. Leader wouldn't bother telling us off then, he'd just kill us outright, said Naruto to his partner before turning to the three other conscious people in the room. If the princess over there disappears, she can live. If she presses her claim to rule, we come back and finish the job. Let's go. The two Akatsuki members turned and began to walk away. Teitwaki, however, was a samurai. And his samurai training had instilled in him a deep sense of honor. He would not allow this threat to leave unchallenged and alive. It was his duty to fight and kill these monsters before they could kill more innocent people. Bolstered by these thoughts, Teitwaki channeled chakra down the length of his sword to increase its cutting potential and swung downwards at the neck of the one who was obviously the leader. His sword connected, and the excess chakra slashed through even the ground below, kicking up a cloud of dust and debris. Shame about your choice, rang out an irritated voice. Teitwaki's eyes widened in shock as the dust settled and he saw that his sword hadn't decapitated the Akatsuki member. Instead, his katana was stopped at the junction of shoulder and neck, having not even penetrated the skin. The blonde turned his head, and Teitwaki got his first clear look at his opponent's golden, toad-like eyes. Shame, but not even an inconvenience. The end of his sentence was punctuated by his right elbow shooting back. 
It made solid contact, but hurt far more than a blow of that speed should have. Taitwaki felt as though the wind had been knocked out of him by a sledgehammer, not an elbow. As he doubled over in pain, the elbow that had been jammed into his abdomen came up and delivered an equally devastating blow to his head. Taitwaki went flying head over heels and landed face down on the wooden floor. As he struggled to get back up, he saw one foot poking out of a black and red cloak. Any thought of where the other foot was ended as the foot in question came down on top of his head. This third blow would be the last one, and Taitwaki died inside the crater the drop kick had created. Naruto turned again and jumped onto one of the clay hawks Didera had made for them, before turning back as he sensed something strangely familiar. His stomach began to ache, but that was easily solved by channeling more natural chakra to the area of his seal. When he turned around, he saw the pseudo Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails looking back at him, slitted pupils glaring back from blood red eyes. In his left hand were the claws that he used to fight, only now they were unconsciously lengthened to several feet. His right hand was holding back the little princess, who was screaming as she tried to get to Taitwaki's body. Naruto decided to encourage his fellow holder of the Nine Tails to better take his place before he left. If you want to be worth our coming to get you, learn to become the weapon you meant to be. Beating the Nine Tails will be better reputation than beating its worthless Jinchuriki anyway. Sora growled under his breath as the two blondes that had decided to make his life hell left with the promise to return once they were ready for his corpse. He finally let the young girl, who he'd learned was called Chio, run to her protector's body to cry. He walked over to Sasuke's battered and unconscious body to heave his rival up over his shoulder. He could only wonder who this Itachi guy was, but if he was in Akatsuki and had it out for Sasuke, the last Uchiha would have to become much stronger. He walked up to the crying princess carrying his classmate, and could only put his arm on her shoulder in comfort. We should get out of here. He would have wanted you to be safe, said Sora sadly. His own emotions were a tangled mess, but he had to keep it together as the mature one. He began walking with the girl not far behind him to find his teammates and go home. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX